Okay. All right. Uh, welcome to Six Scale. Um, it's September 9th. Um, the document links in chat. Add your name as an attendee, please. Um, and feel free to add topics um, while we discuss uh, anything. Okay. Um, so, first uh, item on the agenda um, uh, is an issue for profiling the Qbert control plane. Um, so I created this uh, two days ago. I think uh, Tomas is Tomas here, yeah. Um, so the uh, basically the idea is that, uh, so we have a, a few changes that are actually close to merging the profiler. Uh, we have the load generator. Um, and so this issue is just to track some of the work that we can do to, to profile all the control plane, the different tests we can do, um, <clears throat> things like that. Um, and um, Tomas um, is going to take a look at this, um, but uh, it's something that we can look at as a community. I think there's a lot of um, different tests that we can do. And these are just some of them, but these are just some of the ones I had in mind. Um, but if you have any ideas or things that you want to look at in particular, um, just add them in here and we can kind of use this as our, our source of truth to track uh, some of the different yes. uh, profiling tests. Uh, we plan to scale to up to 1 million concurrent users. And right now, uh, here's Andre from DDesk. Uh, we are uh, reaching something around uh, 10,000 concurrent users every cluster because the, there are some limits on our current infrastructure that is inside Google. Uh, is there anyone that is reaching high numbers of uh, pool like us, like 10,000 concurrent users in a single pool? Um, can you can you elaborate like what you mean like um, 10,000 10, current users? So like this is 10,000 users. Um, this is like how, like how many VMs would you say? Like is this are you saying users for like a Kubernetes cluster? Uh, out the Kubernetes cluster we size because we are inside Google. Uh, the maximum number of uh, VMs inside uh, Google is uh, in a single VPC is fifteen thousand, and okay. that's why we have done uh, in a single VPC ten subnets. In each subnet, we have up to one thousand two hundred and fifty. Yeah. Uh, VMs running uh, the OS, and on top of uh, OS means uh, OKD, and on top of OKD we you, we install Kubevert. Uh, with these one thousand two hundred and fifty cl uh, clusters, we plan to have at up to ten thousand concurrent users, and that's why we are asking if it's uh, possible someone else is reaching already that amount <clears throat> what's a user uh these are vms running windows to be able to do remote desktop okay so every every user is a one-to-one -one relationship with a virtual yes. machine so ten thousand virtual right. machines and one cluster is that right Yes, let me just uh, specify each VM for you know, uh, just one second. Each VM has uh, 16 vCPU and 32 gigabytes of RAM and eight gigabytes of GPU for you know, okay? For you okay. Well, so the question is if anyone's, um, okay. if we've ever run that many virtual machines or uh, I guess I'm trying to understand what we're, what's the topic? Um, we plan to reach 1 million. You say that uh, it's possible to scale uh, what the, are the limits? That's. <laughs> I don't see one million virtual machines running in a single cluster. No, no, across the cluster. Okay. Uh, the, the, what do you mean across multiple clusters? Multiple cluster. There is a limit of <clears throat> clusters, or 
what are the limits? Because can I have one API across all the clusters? That's the kind of uh, uh, questions we have. So some sort of federation or uh, I don't know what. Yeah. yeah. Um, we, we aren't really focused on um, multi-cluster right now. We're primarily interested in how far we can scale within a single cluster. Yeah, hey. how many, um, how many would you say, like Andre, if like this was, we have one cluster, we're, um, you know, what's what would be your target for like the number of VMIs if we were just kind of like, if we were to get to, uh, we we put the limit of ten thousand. Uh, so if 10, I can explain, elaborate a little bit better for you understand. Uh, can you enter my website? ddas.global, then you can understand. Sorry, what is it you want to look at? ddas.global. Double D. D. Okay, then, then what's the spell? Yes. Keep spelling it for you. D e as elephant, as yes. a stop. Yes, that one, the, the first one. Oh, okay. On your list, okay. Uh, go down. We offer these flavors. If you walk, uh, walk the mouse uh, uh, on top of basic standard, you're gonna understand, okay? I, I think we understand what you're doing. You're creating VDI desktops for people. It's a VDI a virtual... desktop right. for you to understand. Got it. And uh, what we, uh, we plan to achieve is 1 million concurrent users because we have today 1.5 million named users. Okay, we plan okay. to migrate uh, from a Citrix solution based on Windows to, uh, let's say, Kubernetes and convert on top of it. And did you see any limitations to uh, on the cluster? What are the limit current limits on a single cluster? This is, is a, a, I so would like to uh, let me stop there for a second. The, the limits um, are, are difficult to put hard numbers on because that's something that's going to be um, specific to the hardware you're using and um, what that hardware and it's capable of both at the node level and the control plane level. Um, I don't know if 10,000 virtual machines is uh, practical or not for a single cluster. I don't think that we've uh, tested at that scale yet to know. Um, I would say as a gauge to understand, like if you're in the ballpark of something that is uh, practical or not, look at what's been um, scheduled for pods on Kubernetes clusters. So if you're looking for how far Kubernetes can scale just with pods, um, I would expect that we would get pretty close with virtual machines to that same um, sort of realm or ballpark, because in the end, we're just were just pods with cumulative processes running inside of them. So uh, that would be like, if you're looking for like hard numbers and just kind of understand right the now, limits of Kubernetes itself, I would look there. No, I, I'm, I'm looking to Kubevirt on top of Kubernetes limits for you understand. What we are using per pod is up to 64 only. Okay, the, uh, on the Kubernetes website, say 110, okay? Uh, then we are covered right now. We are under the, all the limits of that, uh, but we are doing this in, let's say in a hard way. Uh, the, the users came and go and the idea is when the users log off, we just kill the machine. And I don't know if this is already available, uh, like uh, linked clones that we have uh, on, on VMware and Citrix solutions. Uh, can you elaborate uh, how you are doing the pool? Because I saw some, some information ah, about it. Yeah, that's actually something that's been discussed, the idea yeah. of a virtual machine pool. I would pool like you to or... understand better if you can elaborate what is available today. And yeah, so can... what you're asking for is um, the equivalent of an AWS uh, autoscaling group or a Google Cloud Compute Engines um, instance yeah. group or management. That's group. that's what I'm interested on. 
Right. We don't, we don't have that yet. Uh, that's something that's, um, I would say that it's in the progress of being designed. Um, it's something that we keep poking at, but it's something that uh, has yet to gain the kind of traction to actually get implemented quite yet. But it's something we're interested in doing. And I think that your use case um, actually helps us drive that forward a little bit. Um, so let me make sure I understand. You, you're, it's a BDI um, scenario where the users, you don't care about the state of the virtual machine after they log off. So the, you said that the VMs- We VM have another tool uh, that keeps the profile of the user for you understand. Okay. What's happening to the state of the disk, for example, on the virtual machine that the user was on? Is that being restored from somewhere else or what no, happened? Let me explain how it works. Uh, I'm going to put these on the chat window for you understand how we work on Windows. Okay. Uh, we use a, t a technology that Microsoft purchased and offers for free for Windows users that call it FS Logics. During the login of the user, we mount an external VHD drive that on our case has 10 gigs. Uh, and this is where the profile of the users are stored. That's why uh, if we just, uh, instead of only log off, we, we kill the machine is almost the same because everything is stored. Just one second, just one second. Uh, while we while we wait for Andre, maybe we can close this first topic here. Um, just if you guys, um, so I guess the the topic for all basically asked here was that so Tomas is looking at doing some profiling um, of the control plane. Here are some of the tests that we want to do, like the number of VMIs, the number of nodes, um, and the tools that we want to use um, to do it in the pattern we're going to follow. But um, if there are any comments about that, we can uh, we can address them in, in the issue sorry, or if people want. Back. Sorry, okay. sorry for that. <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry, sorry for that. Uh, we plan to have up to uh, one thousand two hundred and fifty nodes in the same in the single cluster. I think the number uh, and we uh, for you understand since we have uh, several flavors. Uh, for you understand, if we have uh, the type one that is two virtual CPU and four gigabytes of RAM, we handle in each node 64 VMs. If we have that uh, with 32 uh, CPUs and 64, uh, uh, let me grab it here. I don't remember everything. Uh, with 16 CPU and 32 gigabytes of RAM, we handle eight per node for you understand, okay? So on the node level, that's pretty low. I think that, that you're not gonna yeah. hit a scalability issue on the node level with 64 virtual machines, or it's unlikely if you have powerful enough hardware. Yeah, my question is how to create uh, in the same cluster, like four pools, that need to go up to 10,000 these four pools, for you understand. We don't have that abstraction today. So the way you can do it is to create your own um, controller or your own API logic that's going to post a VM every time uh, a user is wanting to access a virtual machine and that VM has the um, 
I guess the characteristics of the class or the flavor or whatever you want to call it, and then manually delete that, uh, that virtual machine when you're done with it. So it'd be a one-one relationship between the user uh, logging on and a VM being created. And there wouldn't be a pool mechanism today. Uh, if you want to use Kubert as it is right this moment, that won't exist. Uh, but uh, the mechanism to clone the, the, the disk uh, is available. Yes, you can clone the disk uh, using CDI. Yeah. And um, what would happen is we would use a data volume. The data volume could be associated with the virtual machine. And uh, it, it doesn't like a smart cloning behind the scenes, depending on what your CSI driver is meaning that uh, you're not we actually plan, taking... We plan to use a Gluster and a solution called VGO for also do the, the, the duplication of the disks for, you know. Okay. This is something that we plan to achieve. Okay. All right. That sounds feasible. Yeah, Andre, uh, the, you know, like Dave was saying, virtual machine pools isn't isn't influenced yet. There is a design doc for it. So if you do have, you know, anything you want to talk about with your use case, you know, feel free to review and add your thoughts in there. It's one of the things that we have as on the list of things is covered in this in this SIG that we want to get to eventually. And I think you know having an additional use case would would definitely help push that along. Um, all right, thanks, Andre. Um, so before we move on, I did. Was there any other comments that people had about the first one, like in, uh, about the profiling? Uh, before we move on to the third point, didn't sound like there was anything. But if not, we can always talk on the issue. Okay, uh, let's move to number three. Uh, so VR controller stress stressing with increased number of VMs. Let's look, take a look at the snapshot. Okay. So I want to talk through this. Um, yes. Hi. Um, okay. hey. So I was doing, I was doing the stress, uh, trying to stress my cluster uh, with, with the intent to know where, when does uh, our control plane component start uh, acting up in the sense, uh, do we need any HPA uh, or, or any, any types of auto scaling uh, for, for our control plane components? That was a larger idea and I started um, playing with it and yeah, I'm, st I'm still playing with it, but this is one of the things I, I noticed that, um, yeah, so, so the, the first graph is the number of uh, VMIs in running. Uh, due to the limita limitations of nodes, only 120 could be in running, but I created 1000 VM objects. Out of it, one, only 120 could be scheduled and running. But uh, in the starting, uh, like in the first couple of minutes, 1000 were created and we can see that the, uh, the first four graphs are different, but if you just go at the bottom, the word controller uh, keeps uh, with a high uh, on the left, yeah. The word controller stays high uh, on the CPU even after all the VMIs and VMs are deleted. So it's like 400% of, of the current requested uh, CPU resources. So I think um, I just found it good to be changed or we, we should take a look at it. I see, so you plateau at about like 825 with your count and then Seems like we have a steady level and then we increase. It looks like, is this gar, maybe this is garbage collection or something. We do the deletes and then there's some garbage collection. So with this is 840. Looks like- Sorry, Mike, uh, I'm, I'm still new to Grafana. So uh, it's not uh, it's not showing that line at the same time for two different uh, plots, but yeah. I see. Um, is that what, um, I think this is kind of what Kevin saw when um, in some of his graphs where we where we saw that um, when we do the deletes, there is, um, well, I don't know if it increased. I, I don't remember right? if it was, it, it just at least it hung around at, at least um, a higher level than we expected. Um, maybe doing the garbage collecting, but the, I, I don't know if we expect this. We expect an increase in CPU. It's like almost twice as much. 
for doing the deletes. I'm not sure if this has Kevin's fix uh, in this. I mean, I was just using HCO, um, which was available in, in, in the operator hub. So I'm not sure if Kevin's latest fix is included here. Yeah, the, the fix doesn't doesn't fix that. What uh, Ryan just meant is uh, we saw that when we delete a lot of objects, um, resource utilization stays up for longer than the resources are being deleted um, because right. it takes the Go processes to clean up their memory for a while. And I don't think that's, I, we don't know yet if we can fix that or have to. Yeah, and then, right. And then the other, like this, this, this kind of, I mean, maybe this is like, I mean, you see, like we see, we hit, you hit one, you hit 147, you're kind of peaking at 120. And then you said you had a lot of other um, VMs, objects lying around. I'm wondering if, um, you know, if you're deleting a thousand of them and maybe that's taking some punch more CPU or something. I wonder if, if you did this experiment with just the exact amount, if, the, if this was, uh, if, there's a, if there's a difference at all, like if you didn't just with, with 120, you had 120 running. So what, you create 120 VMs, you have 120 running VMIs, and then you delete them if you see the same pattern. Um, yep. I'm going to try it again. Uh, right now we don't have uh, the metrics for uh, plotting number of VMs, we only have for plotting number of VMIs. So that was one of the lack, lacking point, but I'm going to try this again and yeah, this time have a better graphs. Yeah, and then um, I think Marcel has got a change that we can get also some of the, it would be good to even, uh, like these are some good boards of even having the, um, the standardized ones too. So we can always look at the same ones. Um, we'll make this easier as well. Okay, cool. All right, well, thanks for sharing. Um, definitely something to look at. And you said this was one node, right? I think, right? You said it was one node, you can only put 120 VMs. No, this like was, no, this was five master and 10 nodes. 10 nodes, okay. Uh, but they were small, right? Already... Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I, I said, I, I think I already sent you the, the link to the board we use, we, we have here that um, yeah. Marcelo built for the tests. If you use that next time, maybe. Yep. Uh, yeah, I have that board. Awesome. Okay, cool. Yeah, that will, the reason I mentioned this because it has, um, I think it has these, just so you don't have to go through and create them, it'll make it easier. Uh, for you for next time. Okay. All right. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm definitely curious. Like I said, the, maybe see if like you know how different number of VMs um, that, that you have. Uh, see if it affects this at all. Um, and that's something I can think of. Not maybe we need to look at something here as to why the CPU increases um, right around when you do the deletes. It's, it seems a little weird. And uh, you, that's all you've been deleting VMs, right? Yep. So I would suspect it's because um, there is more API calls in the back deleting the VMIs. And that would increase the total of stuff going on. Um, and then there is still the garbage collection in process because both VM objects and VMI objects get garbage collected in the Go process as well. So it might just be, yeah, normal. I think next time I'm going to keep the VM uh, VMs for uh, longer to see uh, to, to to separate out the to separate out the events so we can yeah. know the charts better. Okay. And this is what's template validator? Is this like um, this is like making sure that the the VM templates are correct or something? Is that is this something? Yes. Uh, okay. Yes, it's and that's that's what my second point is about. Uh, I I also want to I also I also want to see how we can see the latency of uh, webhooks uh, for so Rapid Validator actually creates admission webhook and I wanted to plot a graph of the latency, but I'm not finding a good way to do it with uh, the metrics um, API server request time uh, duration metrics. So if you have any hints about that, I would be it would be helpful. The latency of <clears throat> Uh, of which, well, yeah, I'm curious there. What, what exactly are you trying to measure the latency of? Uh, that if there is an increased number, increased latency uh, 
from the te template validator webhook uh, if the number of v uh, VM VM requests coming is is higher. So measuring the latency of how quickly the that specific web webhook can process requests is that the yes yeah we were the goal was to investigate uh, how much load template validator can get until we should scale up like oh, I see if we should scale large, up and yeah. the the larger larger idea is to see if we need uh, any type of scaling up uh, with increased number of load uh, or increased number of virtual machines interesting yeah it's uh, hard right, to isolate right. that so that's that webhook's just one part of the chain of the entire request uh, yes hmm. yeah i also don't think there is a kubernetes metric for webhooks specifically so um that would be an interesting called. feature request for Kubernetes to to expose that. Yeah, true. Or because they're the only ones it's that something really know, we should right? measure on our end. Yeah, can we like, I mean, on our we end, can make, no. Yeah, we, we can add a Prometheus handler to our, our webhook handlers. I uh, you can the webhook itself can expose how long requests on itself take. Um, Don't you need to, to accurately measure latency, measure it from the client? Yeah, right. That's um, we we don't know the latency. We wouldn't we would not know the latency from the API so to the webhook. That's a different story. Okay. True. Uh, and right the template now, validator. What what webhooks does it register? What's it actually looking at? Just a second, finding the exit uh, line. Um, template validator looks at VMs created from OpenShift templates um, and validates that they comply with the template they are created from. The same for the VMI, it also validates that the VMI is created from that, it does not change any values that collide with the templates being created from. So it's a uh, an update webhook. So it cares even after the VM has been created. It is only validating, as far as I know, and uh, but it still cares that you don't change the VM after it's been created because it also upgrades the templates with our upgrades. Like we guarantee the VMs created from those templates work. So we make sure the user doesn't break any VM created from a such template. Whoa, that's strange. Well, hmm. has that always been the case? So we're we're saying that a person who has launched a VM, uh, let me just make sure I get this straight. Uh, the person launching a VM using a template does not have the ability to modify values that were set by the template on their VM? Yes. As far as I know, yes. There might be some values they are allowed to change. Like we're, um, for example, what we're looking at, we're we're we're, we're allowing them to change um, resource limits, for example. I think, but uh, in general, yeah, you shouldn't change a template that you create from a VM well, that okay, from got a template. Okay, got it. Yeah. Um, huh. That's kind of curious. I think that's orthogonal necessarily to our, our discussion here, but I'd like to know more about that. Maybe out of band. Yeah. I mean, similar to what we do with the flavors, right? Sure, kind yeah. of. Um, hmm. Interesting. So, um, sorry, that was a tangent for a second. Uh, these VMs that are being created, do they use PVCs? And are they doing any sort of cloning or anything like that? Like, what's the storage that they were using? They can be anything. I mean, we don't we don't limit it by uh, in, in any of the templates. No, I, I, I'm talking. I'm sorry. I'm talking about the the load tests that you did uh, where you were using VMs. Ah, what, uh, yeah, it's 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 a container image. Okay. All right, all right. At some point, it would be nice, um, and I, I don't know if we have the right environment for this quite yet. To understanding uh, the uh, impact of using PVCs because there's more API calls and things like that in our control plane associated with uh, VMs, especially VMs that uh, have PVCs attached to them than just the container disk flow, because we're, we're doing more uh, informers and all that kind of stuff. Isn't there always a PVC behind it? Like, doesn't the container disk get cloned into a PVC? 
Yeah. Or is that okay. optional? Only if you use a data volume. So you can ah, say, okay. uh, I have a data volume and I want the source to be this container disk and I want to put on the stateful PVC. But if you just have a volume, uh, just like you do in a VMI, a container disk there, what mm. happens behind the scenes is we create an ephemeral uh, drive or disk or whatever and share um, some data across that. Uh, okay, yeah. Something like that at least. Yeah, then, then that would be interesting because I think it's a primary use case. Like, yeah. Yeah, so at some point when we're talking about the VM um, use case, understanding the scale of VMs and not VMIs, we need to start introducing PVCs there. Um, but the problem with that is that uh, we begin to be throttled by our storage provider. So how quickly it can provision PVCs and um, things like that, that's going to be um, a new, I guess, graph or something like that for us to understand what's actually within our control. So we don't have control over how quickly storage is provisioned for a VM as part of the start flow. Uh, we need to be able to separate that from what we do have control over. Mm -hmm. May I ask, uh, what is the uh, persistent storage use it uh, on these tests, uh, like rock? Uh, Gluster, what is use it? That's so that's what we were discussing. It's not, we're not actually using persistent storage for these load tests today. And that's what I was pointing out that we need to start doing in order to understand the impact of that. Um, what's happening today is we're using ephemeral storage. So it's like local storage on the node that's being on demand provisioned for these virtual machines as they land on the node, uh, which Helps like, us understand the characteristics on, of our on, yeah. on the on on the node. Yeah, yeah. It's just using it's the equivalent of local storage. You could think of it like that. Uh huh. So it's the specific storage type. It's called a container disk. And what we've done is we've put a virtual machine image in a container, upload that to a container registry. And every time a virtual machine is launched on a node, um, it's using the image in a container and using that locally on the node. There's one more thing I noticed uh, in this graph and in the logs, but uh, it's probably out of scope of this uh, discussion. It was that this webhook actually just monitors for virtual machines, but if you if you see in the attempted validity to CPU graph, the uh, the second hill the second hill we see um, that just left to it, uh, yeah, that was the right to it. Sorry, one more right, yeah. So that uh, that one was when uh, when uh, the VMIs were actually getting created out of the VM objects. Um, so I saw that in the logs that in, in, in the logs for the tablet validator that, that there are entries two times. So um, probably missing something, uh, but it can also poss be possible that when VM status is changing, uh, there's another request coming in to validate the VM. Yeah. I'm not sure, but I think that, that's, that's exactly what I saw. That's what's happening. Uh -huh. That makes sense. So when the VMIs are launched, um, it's mutating the uh, VM status, which means it's going through that same uh, webhook every time we do that. Uh, yeah. Is there any possibility that VM status will keep changing in further in the VM's life cycle? I'm uh, just think, thinking out loud. It should stabilize. Cool. Um, again, in that specific case, template validator doesn't even care about status as far as I know. So, um, it still gets it though. Yeah, it still gets it, right? You can't tell it to not get status. That's curious. Changes. So, Roman, maybe you're on this call. Uh, I think we use the status sub resource for VMs. Is there, I don't know if there's a way to say for a webhook that we only want to view spec changes and not status changes. Yeah, that... I think you can only do it the other way around. You can only view status changes. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I barely. Uh, barely, okay. But at least, <laughs> uh, at least a little bit. Um, yeah. <laughs> very little. <laughs> <laughs> Um, one second. Uh, 
No, sir, I can't make myself louder at the moment. Uh, we, the, the VMI is, are we talking about VM or VMI? VM. So uh, the VM has the status sub resource enabled. You can write at both locations, but not at the same time from a webhook. So you can use the status sub resource endpoint to modify it with the patch, for instance, or the spec. But if you, for instance, do an update and modify both, it will only update the spec. No, what we mean, kind of, kind of watch, uh, kind of watch, watch only the spec and only the status because I think no, it can only watch the status. Watches is everything. Not even only status. Yeah. Okay. Sad. <laughs> okay. Thanks. May I ask another thing? Uh, these tests are running on bare metal servers or a v a nested VM on, on, on nested on, VMs on, on Azure Cloud? Uh, where? Azure. Azure. Uh, can you give me what type of machine are you using? If I remember correct, they were the D2S uh, on D8S type of virtual machine used for masters. And so it, essentially the, the masters had eight, eight GB of RAMs and the worker nodes had two GB of RAM with two CPUs each. Standard D8S V3, it is. Yes, that one. Uh, can you put on the chat window? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Uh, but till next time, uh, when you run this test, can you keep the Grafana board long, running for a bit longer? I would be curious if root controller memory goes down to its normal before as well. Yep, I'm, I'm going to use the new dashboard with a longer time this time. I mean, when I do next. Like... Looks like it is. You can kind of get the just the end of Yeah, but the, no, the memory on the right. Is... Oh, the memory. Yeah, it's, it's making its way down. But yeah, it would be nice to see. Yeah, I mean, I like the thing that's curious to me is it's like, like what Zelig mentioned, like this, this peak here, it lines up when we do the, when we do the deletes, um, what, what is going on? I, I don't know. I mean, it'd be good. Like, I think we, we said we have a few tests you can try with, you know, if we use the, I think I heard you said you're using more VMIs than we can, or more VMs than we can actually account for with VMIs. So maybe we can try different numbers there and then keep this long, running longer and see how it goes. Um, see if we can isolate some of what is going on here. I'll try to get the PProf thing merged soon. So then you could actually, if you wanted, uh, yeah. do the PProf profile during that, that hump and maybe get some interesting results. Definitely. Cool. Sorry to borrow you time again. This is running on, on CentOS. Seven, eight, or Red Hat Enterprise? You mean the host or the guest? Yeah, the host. I, I think it's probably Reddit Core OS. Yeah, Core OS. This is an OpenShift cluster. OK. OK. Also, does it make sense for us to have a, a, a metric for VMs and not just VMI? I, I could not find one metric for um, VM number of VMs in the cluster. Yeah, it, it's a good it's a good topic to discuss because, um, like we we've mentioned, and I think it's been mentioned before, and, and I think there's definitely some use cases, and you're kind of alluding to some of them here. Like, like what's you know, like you can imagine some latency. Like, what is the latency between you know when you set something to running to maybe when the PMI is running? There's a lot of areas here. Like, there's API calls. There's, um, there's other things that are happening, um, even the count of the number of VMs, um, that would also, I think, would be useful. I think it's, it's in this area of perfect scale. So, I mean, 
if you have, I mean, I think this is a good area that we can kind of, um, I mean, if you want, we can take a few minutes now, we can talk about some ideas and I can add to the list of, of metrics. Right now, what we have is a breakdown of everything that transitions after VMI is actually posted. What we're lacking, like Ryan, you're saying right here, is we lack everything that occurs before that VMI is posted. So okay. when we're using a VM, we don't have any sort of visibility and how long, uh, for example, the storage provisioning takes or just the uh, going from a VM being posted to actually posting the VMI. We don't, we don't know what that latency is. Um, but so just, I think the number of resources of any resource you should be able to get with cube state metrics. I don't know if there are, but you fall on open shift somehow or what you need to do to get them. But I think that's the tool to go. If you just want to know how many objects are there. Um, I'll take a look. A... Yeah, but you could, uh, well, what about like, like we do right now, we do, we, we count like the number of like, uh, VMI is in a, in a state. Like, I don't know what other states there, but I mean, it's like, I think it's paused, right? For VMs, it's running, there's, I don't know what else there is. I mean, maybe that could be valuable. Um, so there might be some other ones, like not just like yeah. the count, the number it might just be able, we might be able to get the a more granular breakdown. But yes, like if, if, if you're posting thousand VMs, there's still uh, some time between a VM is actually created and a VMI, even with the scheduling or scheduled, uh, state yeah. comes into into effect. Does um does the VM resource mirror the state of the VMI, or is it just like running or not running or something? It, it mirrors a few of the values, kind of. I think that maybe some of the conditions um, are are mirrored, um, but it definitely does not have the same granularity that the VMI does. So. There's a lot more in the VMI than is on the VM. Okay. All right. Well, um, if we want to, so we have 15 minutes left. It, we don't have any more topics. So if if people, if we don't do, does anyone want to talk about anything? Otherwise, we can use this time. We can, maybe we can come up with a few metrics here um, for VMs. I think it's worth writing out before we do. Is there anything else people want to bring up? Uh, the one, well, so has any more, do we have any progress update on the periodics or anything like that? I know there's a task waiting on me to integrate things like perf audit and stuff like that. I'm just curious, being, any work's been done in that area that we should review uh, over the past week? Who's working on it? I don't know who's working on it. Uh, I know Marcelo uh, initiated some of the, the first periodics things like that. So if no work's been done, we're done uh, for topic, for that topic. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't going to stomp on anybody if I end up um, working on that a little bit in the next few days. Okay. Yeah, I don't, looks like Marcella isn't here. We might have to follow oh. them offline. Okay. That's it. We can skip over this. Okay. Um, well, why don't we take a few minutes? Let's, let's talk about some more some more metrics because I mean I've heard a few here just being thrown out not just the VM metrics like I also heard this one like the um the the volume creation one like that like I heard that one as well um that we can enumerate on some of these so like so what is like what's a valuable what are valuable metrics for VM like I think so like I don't know, like count, uh, like what, what, what's the data we want to get? Like what's the, if we're reading, you know, a metric, what do we want to get from it? Like how can we, what are some ideas? So one of the things that's kind of difficult about the VM is we don't have a phase. Um, so we don't have a clear transition between different um, states like we do with the VMI. Uh, so we have to look at it a little bit differently. Um, there's not a clear delineation between all the different possibilities, I guess is what I'm getting at. The things I care about is understanding how long it takes for storage provisioning to occur before launching the, the VMI. That's one, one gap that we have that kind of gates the ability to, to start a VMI. So what's the difference between uh, the storage provisioning with a VM metric than it just from the VMI? Like, would this be like, would this be uh, something that's specific to VMs or is this like this yeah. would be 
is specific to VMs. So there's uh, a okay. VM feature similar. Okay, so think about a stateful set. Uh, with a stateful set today, you have a PVC or persistent volume claim template, and you specify what you, what kind of storage you want every one of these replicas to have. And when a new replica comes online, new storage is provisioned that's specific for that replica. In a virtual machine, uh, we have something similar to that called a data volume template, which is going to clone a, nor a new PVC for uh, that specific in instance of the VM. So we take another PVC or some other data source, make a new PVC that's just consumed by this VM containing that contents. So that process, how long that takes, uh, is interesting uh, to me. Okay, so this is different than like, say, getting a PVC, or does it include that? This is like, we're gonna ask for like, we said like, we're gonna clone a disk. Like there's multiple steps than just getting the PVC involved in provisioning storage here. Yeah, so it's, okay. um, it's the creation and population of the PVC before the VM uh, starts or the VMI is posted. So that's that's exercising a lot more. Okay. That's that. more than our control plan. That's the CDI control plan because that's the thing that's actually going to be populating the PVC. Uh, and then it's the storage provider itself. So the, the CSI, the underlying CSI storage class that's um, actually creating the storage, network storage for us and um, how quickly it can whatever is involved with populating uh, the storage. So it might be a smart clone, which would be really quick, perhaps, or it could be um, something that's a little bit more involved. Okay. Makes sense to me. Okay, what other things uh, people have in mind? Uh, for the desk, uh, is the amount of IOPS uh, each VM and the total uh, uh, we have on, on the, the server or, or node. How would you measure IOPS? Uh, is that something that the storage, like Luster? Yes. Would? Okay. Yes. It's regarding the storage, the IOPS. Completely. Um, <laughs> we do a tricky things to make it happen uh, on our solution, but uh you can understand i would like to better understand if we can get these metrics for measure not only a single vm but the average of all vms in this this node uh the total iops I'm, I'm getting okay we already with this the metric for iops for vm vmis in, it's rather new, but we already have one for oh. storage IOPS. Is that, is that specific to the VMI? Is it like one of those runtime metrics? Yeah, it's for VMI. The other thing that uh, the desk use, we use GPU on, on the uh, guest VMs. And that's why we better uh, we need to measure the amount of, of, of processing is, is having. And the uh, problem we, we find is also we measure the temperature, temperature of the uh, GPU on, on, on the node also for, you know, in the current version that is without Kubevert for, you know. Uh, you might get that, well, for the node. I mean, the one that I, at least that interests me, like, I guess, with what you said, is like the, like, device plugin latency. Um, this would rely, though, on something external. Like, we ha you have to have, like, if you're using NVIDIA's, you're using the NVIDIA's GPU device plugin. Like, you, you're relying on that latency. Yeah. I mean, that one, we could... Um, I mean, that could be something that I guess we record in here. Like, I'm just trying to think. Um, I mean, because the, the device plugin could also expose its own metrics. Um, yes, I'm just but trying it, to think what. It expose, it expose, uh, it expose the entire GPU, 
what I, I, I would like to, to have is the amount of GPU processor and temperature for this specific VM, guest VM, for you understand. Okay. If it's possible. <laughs> I don't know if it's possible. Um, yeah. Uh, because we slice the GPU in profiles, the what I would like to con to see the metrics is for this specific EVM, what is this GPU usage for you understand? Yeah, it's tricky because like I think some of the stuff you're gonna have to have access, like quite a bit of access to the host file system, probably to the kernel's file system to get some of the stuff. I think it's a lot of it's in sys. Um, which this is done. Let me give you the code what we are using. Uh, just one, one second. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think, well, I'll write it down because it's so like, I mean, it's something to consider because like device plugin, I mean, there, in terms of like, if we're measuring this, this also isn't specific to, to VMs. I mean, I think, um, but th this is something where I mean, we would want to know in terms of like our total performance. Uh, it is something that can certainly affect the the you know the the gauge, like push it one way or another if we're slow. So it is good to know. Um, I guess trying to find the right way to measuring it to measure it is the, the challenge. So, but I'll write it down here. So it's something I had in the other one too. I think it, it makes sense to something just finding the right place. Yes. <laughs> um, and you said GPU temperature. Something we can also look at. And processor, yeah. GPU processing. But temperature is not something that from for the node that we can correlate to the yes. VMs. Yeah, so, so it, no, it's no, not on it's, the VM level. It's on the VM level because you give a profile and this profile has uh, the, this the temperature. For instance, like the node uh, has like for GPUs, which one is using this VM is using for you understand? Yeah, the, the challenge is though, like, like I was saying, like, where are you going to get this information? Like, it's probably in SIS. <laughs> so, it, like, that's where it's the, <laughs> like, you're not going to get that with Vert Launcher. Like, that, that's where it's a little bit above. I don't know. I like this is where I'm thinking, like, the device plugin is going to have access to some of this. So, it, it could be that that's the place where this goes. But um, I mean, I think we, we need to explore this a little more because I, I'm not so sure if it if we know the whole picture here. Great, go on. Okay, so what are the other, uh, so what, how about some other ideas? What else do we wanna know about VM metrics? Um, I, I mentioned like, well, I, I heard, uh, um, let's all say uh, some count and I kind of expanded on the idea of count. Like, do we, like what are well, how would I do, how what's the right way to describe this? Like, is it just the number of VMs? Like, is it like it, does it make sense to break down by like the number that are running, number that are not running? Is that like could that be like a like a histogram or something? Is that be a metric we could do? Is that valuable? I think it's valuable to know how many VMs we have uh, yeah. that are not running, which is something okay. that we don't have at the moment. We do have it for, with the phases. But uh, for running uh, VMIs, but uh, not for VMs. Are these, is this like a status? Like, what's the, how do they, how is like running um, or not running like on VMs? How is that displayed? We can get it from the, uh, <clears throat> we can get it from a condition on the status. It's, so it's a condition. Okay. We, so I think there's three buckets here there, there's provisioning, there's uh, running and then there's shutting down. Okay. Okay. Uh, shutting and down and it stopped. Or, is yeah. there put a pause too? Is that one? A pause is part of the phases. What, what would know? that tell us? Like pause? I, I mean, that's. Well, you can. It's running still, technically. Yeah, it's still right. running. I, Okay, I wasn't sure if that was a phase because I know that it for VMs because I know like the um well it doesn't it's not a, it's not a specific VMI phase but I know you could pause. I wasn't sure if it gets reflected on the, the VM as well. So I guess it sounds like it's not silly running. Okay, stop shutting down, running, provisioning. Okay, 
So, I mean, what we just say all the places. Is there a maintenance? It be a maintenance. What are the what are the current phases? Like, is this do, do, do we can there we are no all? phases? Oh, I mean, what are the current conditions that we post on the um, on the VM? Are this <clears throat> do we have a list of them? Uh, I mean, I'm assuming that's what we do here. Is that we is this is just all the conditions that can? I don't know it's... how well our list correlates to a condition. I mean, it correlates to a condition, but I don't know how accurately. I think it's more of a status, no? State well, so, status. So if we're saying stopped, like how would I, if, 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 let's say, I'm assuming these are all conditions that we can get on the object. Like if they're not, I don't know how we quantify it. Like how, how would we say something is stopped? That's what I'm saying. Like we, whatever whatever the conditions are is what I, is what I think we should list here. And I don't think it should be any different than that list. What we have is the best thing we have is um, it's not meant for this purpose, but I'll say it. Uh, we have something called a virtual machine printable status, and what it is is an, it, it looks at the virtual machine status and it aggregates all the conditions to try to come up with a human readable explanation for the state of the virtual machine. So that's going to be, uh, okay. for example, uh, looking at all the conditions and saying uh, this virtual machine is stopped or this virtual machine is provisioning or starting or running or paused or whatever. Um, I think when we're looking at creating a metric, uh, we're probably going, going to want to kind of perhaps replicate some of this to understand what's occurring with the virtual machine, but it's, it's not an official like, it's not a stable necessarily, um, way of doing that because it's meant to convey information to the user, not necessarily programmatically to uh, like something that's consuming the VMI status directly. But it's not meant to act on the human readable status, but maybe that's useful for us just to see. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, it sounds like, I, I'm not familiar with all the conditions, so it sounds like, it, it sounds like yeah, there's a lot, okay, that we could, we could do on this based on what people want to do. I mean, to me, like, what's what's the simplest? What are the? I mean, what, if we were to pick, you know, a few simple ones here, I mean, is it, these sound pretty, pretty reasonable. Stop shutting down, running, provisioning. That's what I, would I mean. Do. How would you get? How would you get stopped though? Like, um, this no means that the VMI is running. It's in a state, is, and no VMI is present. Okay, so this would be um, after shutting down. Showing that would be a run strategy of halted and the VMI is still active. Okay. Provisioning means that we're creating one. Maybe there's not quite that the VMI. That there, the VM is posted. There's no VMI created yet. So okay. something is occurring as a precondition to launching the VMI. I see. Okay. And so then I shut think, it down, yeah. though, there is no VMI as well when shutting down? Shutting down, if it's in the process of shutting down, that would mean that the we've declared that the run strategy on the VM is halted, but the VMI is still online. So it's in the process of being torn down. Uh, it might conflict with the running. Uh, running would mean that the run strategy declared state is that we want the VM to be running. Mm -hmm. So it, we wouldn't necessarily conflict. It would it would cross over to shutting down once we've declared that we want the state to not be running. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's kind of a, a, a missing between provisioning and running, which is booting, like the VM I is there, but the VM is not there yet, right? Uh, I think, hmm. Not that we could, I, I well, we could tell, but I, I don't think we need it, but I, I'm just like from the starting. I think that would be it. Yeah, starting. starting. So no, no, no. Provisioning? provisioning still makes sense. Uh, starting yeah, would be after provisioning. There. Yeah. So, that's, so this is uh, VMI exists, right? And, but it's but not, it's not running yet. Yeah. So that's all the but phases worried... between a VMI being posted and actually hitting running. What I'm worried is that 
if I'm looking at it and I want to see like a pie chart, I want to see my VMs with what status and how many I have in each state. And then I go to the uh, metric about uh, with the phases for each phase. And if I look at the running um, and the number that I see in the, when I aggregate on the phase metric, will I get the same number or will it include also starting and shutting down? Running, I would expect would be very close to each other, uh, probably yeah. identical. Okay. But the other ones would be less accurate. So starting, for example, um, a, a VM and a starting um, whatever bucket, I don't know what we're calling these, the starting metric would include VMs and scheduling, scheduled, and um, pending everything leading up to the actual running. So there's multiple phases on a VMI that mm -hmm. map to the starting phase, or I don't know what we're calling it on the VM. I, I, I need to jump off. I'm sorry. I just remembered I have another okay. meeting. Yep. Yeah, we're a little bit over. OK. Uh, yeah, thanks, everybody. We'll uh, see you mm -hmm. next week. Have a good day. Bye. Good discussion. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye.